Well, good morning. Part of my goal for this morning, this is going to be a little bit of a pep rally, uh, because this is an important Sunday. Uh, we are going from two services, as it was mentioned, to three services next week. Uh, we've never done that in the history of this church. And so I want us to look at just exactly how is this church going to grow, how has it grown in the past, and how are we expecting to fill another service and even fill this service at 8 o'clock. You know, one of the things that I love about our church, and when I say church, I'm referring to the people. Um, The church is not a building or an organization, but the people of Oak Creek have always dreamed big. Uh, I love, like going back decades, there was always an expectation that God was going to move through this body of believers. You know, when our church relocated from South Milwaukee to Oak Creek in 1970, uh, with our own hands, we built a building that sat about 100 people. Um, But there were actually architectural plans for a sanctuary that would seat 1,000. And at that time, that was unheard of. Churches didn't build 1,000-seat sanctuaries unless you were a basilica. Now, when we opened this sanctuary in 2001, evangelist Randy Ruiz, he had a vision for this space. He said, this would be a warehouse for souls. You know, a few years after that, we were doing our prayer time, and we do this every Friday morning, and you're welcome to come and join us. But as we were walking through, you know, my dad received a vision of this sanctuary being filled five times on a Sunday. Next Sunday, we're taking a step towards that vision. You know, it's a big move. It's more work. It requires more faith. It's a little bit scary, and it begs the question, how does God grow the church? What is the role that God plays? What is the role that we all play? And so if you want to be used by God in a a greater way in this next season of Harvest, I just want you to lean in and to answer this question of how God grows the church. We're going to be looking in Acts chapter 13. It's the story of the very first missions trip, that is, in the New Testament. As far as we know, in the 13 to 15 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus, there had been no other trips like this. And so here's a group of believers. They're praying. They're believing. They're saying, God, what do you want us to do? And God says, I want to send you on a missions trip. Um, And so we're going to walk through this story, and we're going to ask the question, what are the certain things that God uses to grow the church Acts 13, verse 1. It says, Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. And as we read through this list, there's five in particular. And in the Greek language, they're always listed in order of importance, the most important first. And so it says Barnabas, Simeon, called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And so first I want you to notice in this list, let Paul, or Saul, he is an apostle, but he is not yet recognized as an apostle. Matter of fact, he's listed as the fifth most important leader in the church of Antioch. But by the end of this trip, when he's with Barnabas, he will be listed first. And so this whole rising up and being recognized of the call of God in his life, it begins with this particular journey. This is a good word for all of us, but I think especially for young leaders. You know, some days we know what God has called us to do. We know what God has gifted us to do, but we get impatient and we can get ahead of God's timing. You know, Peter was probably the most impatient of all of the apostles, and he says this to young leaders. He says, 1 Peter 5, 6, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. So now back to verse 2 here. It says, While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. And we'll come back to this a little bit later, but this wasn't, you know, a general revival meeting. Hey, whoever is willing to pack up your bags and leave, it was a call for two specific people. 
Verse 3, so after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salmaeus, they proclaimed the word of God in Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. So we'll come back to this as well, but notice that they proclaim the word of God in Jewish synagogues. Um, And the reason they went there is because they were welcome there. Let any man who was learned was welcome to stand up and speak and say a word. They could say, you know what, here's the Old Testament uh, prophecies, and here's how they point to the true Messiah, Jesus. And so whenever uh, people started believing, they would gather and become a church. Verse 6, they traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and a false prophet named Barjesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. And so here they meet a sorcerer, they meet a Jewish false prophet, and it's important to note that Jews were specifically forbidden from practicing in astrology or sorcery or black magic. The law of Moses said you should have nothing to do with these things, and this was actually a capital offense. They would kill you if you were involved. And so this guy, he has real powers. He's a sorcerer, and so he's an assistant to the proconsul, uh, and that is the leader of this whole province of Rome. So he's an important man, and suddenly there's an unexpected door. He wants to hear the news about Jesus and the gospel. But then we run into an unfortunate thing. There's an interference in verse 8. It says, But Elmaeus, the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. See, Elmaeus, he had influence. The people around him were really impressed with his sorcery. So he had a lot of power, and he tries to use his influence to turn the proconsul away from faith in Christ. Verse 9, then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elmaeus and said, you are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. And so immediately a mist or darkness came over him, and he's just groping about, trying to find his way, trying to have someone lead him by the hand. And this is the same type of blindness that God used on Saul when he was on his way to Damascus to persecute the Christians and to throw them in jail. It was a temporary blindness. And so this guy, who is a false prophet, he's impressing everyone with his sorcery. He's trying to influence the proconsul. Now he's going around saying, will someone please take my hand? Will someone please take my hand? Can someone help me? I've fallen. I can't get up. I mean, this is sit down. You know, this is step off. I mean, this is a major putting in his place. Verse 12. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed. And see, here's the turning point. He saw something. He saw power. For he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. He wasn't just won over by words and by message. He was won over by the power. You know, when it comes to representing Jesus, you and I, we have to represent him with our words, but also with power. If it's simply words and no power, no one is going to listen. And so I was at the gym recently. I've been trying to work out, and I received unsolicited advice. Now, we'll do another sermon another day on unsolicited advice But the person says, trust me, I do this all the time. You're not doing that right. I know what I'm doing. And uh, I just kind of sized them up. And here's what I was thinking. If you know the right thing to do, if you know this exercise, then why are you not doing the exercise? Right? 
You see, if you come up to me, you know, you've got a six-pack and bulging biceps, I'll pay attention. But if you have more of a keg than a six-pack, I'm not open to taking workout advice from you. But that's another sermon for another day. You see, representing Jesus in words and in power, the power of a changed life that people see right in front of them that makes them envious and curious, that is so powerful. Verse 13, it starts another story, but this will be the last verse this morning. It says, From Paphras, Paul and his companions sailed to Perga and Pamphylia, where John left them to return to Jerusalem. Remember that John, he is mentioned earlier in verse 5, he was a helper to Barnabas and to Saul on this missionary journey. But right after this great victory, he just bails on them. We don't know why, but he says, I have to go back to Jerusalem. And as we discover later, that wasn't necessarily a good or helpful thing. And so this is our passage, and I want us to ask the question, what can we take from here to see the different ways that God grows the church. And the first thing is this. It's the principle that everyone has a role to play. Everyone has a position, and you need to be in your position. Now, unfortunately, we're in a culture that is extremely self-centered. We are the generation that perfected the selfie. We found a way to turn the camera on ourselves instead of outwards. And so we think now that we are the superstar of the story. And so when we read the Bible, we always put ourselves in as the main character. So we're, we're reading about Moses, and we're Moses. Our toes are in the Red Sea. You know, we're Joseph, we're Job, we're Gideon, we're Esther, we're Jesus. You know, we never seem to read the story and picture ourselves as we're one of the people in the crowd. We're the innkeeper. We're the uh, unnamed disciple. We're always the star of the show because we get to believe we get to choose our role. You know what? I think I'm going to be Moses today. I think I'm going to be Esther for such a time as this. But you don't get to choose your assignment. God does. I think the church has often been hurt. The spread of the gospel has been hindered because we believe we get to choose our position and there are all sorts of people playing out of position. The truth of the matter is most of us, we're gonna be called into a ministry at our work, in our home, in the marketplace. And notice what we pointed out in verse two. It says, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit says, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. The Holy Spirit didn't say, you know what, start a revival meeting and whoever you can recruit into the mission field, the Holy Spirit didn't say, you know what, whoever can go, whoever can raise the funds can go. He says, I want you to set apart two people for me, Barnabas and Saul. And so that is very specific. And I want you to know, as soon as you give your life to Christ, as soon as you cross that line of faith, Like, God also has an assignment for you. It fits with your talents. It fits with your passions. And most of us, we're going to represent Jesus Christ, that ministry right in the marketplace, if you will. 1 Peter 2.9 says this of all Christians. He says, but you are a chosen people. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Colossians 3.17 says, And whatever you do, whether it is in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father through him. You see, whatever we do, whatever our job is, we do our best because ultimately we are working for the Lord. We're representing Jesus. And so this week, I went to Salon Spa here in Oak Creek. Joni and I, we like going to this place for haircuts. It's owned by a lady from our church. And no matter which employee we talk to, uh, when the church comes up, they're all very familiar with it. They have all been invited to it. And it all goes back to the faith of the owner. 
And the good news is being spread all across that salon, busy salon. Why? Because the owner is playing her position. Our daughters attend public school here in Oak Creek, and their art teacher started coming to the church about a year ago, and she's grown so much in her faith, and she is teaching our kids, my kids can draw better than I can. And they're in second grade in kindergarten. And uh, she says this, you know what, in my classroom, she says, I'm a gatekeeper. I'm the light at this school. And I said, yes, you are. And that school would not be the same without you there. Thank you for playing your position. You see, the problem is some of us, we view the Holy Spirit like he's a military recruiter and he just goes around tapping on shoulders, trying to convict us, see who's willing to go, And the most highly committed of us, yeah, we'll go. And the rest of us losers, well, we'll stay back. We'll do our jobs. Maybe we'll cut a check every now and then or pray. And so many Christians, shortly after they get saved, they have this internal battle. Am I supposed to go into full-time ministry? You know, is God calling me to another continent? And so what happens is people leave their influence, their areas of great fruitfulness, to go into areas of frustration in ministry, a role that is outside of their calling. And so maybe the Holy Spirit would just say to you this morning, would you relax? You know, if God is calling you to something, that God's going to confirm that with an inner prompting. You know, I'm kind of old school on this. If God's going to tell me something, he's going to tell me first, and then he's going to confirm it with other people telling me that's God's calling on your life. You see, you and I, we are not free agents. We don't go running off trying to prove we're more committed than everyone else. And what that does is it actually sets the church back. It sets the growth of the gospel back because we're all trying to outprove one another. We're playing roles that were not designated for us. You see, whether you're in the neighborhood or, or every relationship you have at work is incredibly important in representing Jesus and sharing the gospel. And so as we grow as a church, we all have a role to play. You need to know that role. You need to seek God out. What is my role to play? The second thing we see in this story is as the church grows, it grows when we look for open doors. Uh, We read in this passage that the synagogue, it was the ultimate open door. And so if you were Jewish and you had any schooling at all, you were a man, you were welcome to stand up right in the middle of service and you could speak. And so you could say, you know what, this is what Isaiah says about the Messiah and here's how Jesus fulfills that. And so this was an open door. What is an open door? An open door is simply an openness to the gospel. And I want you to notice the first thing they do on this missions trip is they ask, Where is the low-hanging fruit? Where's the open door? Where's the open opportunity for someone to listen? And so they proclaimed the word of God where they were welcomed, and that was in the synagogues. Now, sometimes you and I, we will try to barge down closed doors. Um, Sometimes we go where we've not been invited or we're answering questions that have not been asked, and Jesus didn't barge in closed doors. He said, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. You know, when Jesus sent people out before him in his ministry, kind of as an advanced team, uh, all four Gospels mention this, but Jesus had very specific instructions for them. When you go and you find that a door is closed to you, here's what Jesus said in Matthew 10, 14, if anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, Leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. And so as a church that grows, we have to play our position and we have to look for where the open doors are. The third thing that we see in this story is we need to earn the right to be heard. You know, Jesus himself, he didn't just show up somewhere and start preaching. What he actually did is he earned the right to be heard. When he came to a town, he would do miracles. He would establish his credibility, and then he would share the gospel. And I want you to see this in Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. 
where at the beginning of his ministry, this is after his baptism, and this is after his testing, his temptation in the wilderness. It says, verse 23, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues. Again, Jesus is going where the open doors are, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. And so Jesus, he didn't just give true words, he gave help as well. And what happened because of that, verse 24, news about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and healed them. You know that the crowd that Jesus drew was not a crowd that came to hear him. Um, These were not spiritual seekers. This was a crowd that came to be healed. And so as Jesus earned that credibility, as he earned the right to be heard, they were open to hearing what he had to say. You know, to take this further, you know, in the Gospels, you see Jesus, he's recruiting his disciples. And when we read the passage, it sounds like Jesus says, come follow me. And immediately they left everything and followed him. But in each and every case, when Jesus says, come follow me, there's a backstory. It was not the first encounter. Um, They had other encounters where they saw what Jesus did and they heard what he said and, and they hung out together. And then when it comes up again and Jesus says, come follow me, they're ready then to follow. He earned the right to be heard and he spoke the truth. The fourth thing that we see in this principle for the church to grow is we speak up when we're asked. Verse 7, it says, The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. Saul and Barnabas, they didn't say, Hey, let's find out where the proconsul lives and let's camp outside of his house and ambush him. No, this was an unexpected opportunity. This was a leader of that whole Roman province. And this guy has heard what's going on. He has seen what is going on. And now he says, I want you to come and tell me the word of God. I would call that an open door. I would call that earning the right to be heard. And so now Peter, again, the most uh, impulsive of all of the apostles, he has a word for us as to when we're supposed to speak up. And it goes like this, 1 Peter 3.15. He says, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. In other words, let's make sure that Christ really is the Lord of your heart, not just in words, but in reality. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. When they ask you, why do you seem happy? Why do you have peace? Be ready to give that answer, but notice something else as well. It says, but do this with gentleness and respect. You see, this is equally important because there are people who will never be argued or shamed into the kingdom of God. You see, in my mind, the problem today, there is too many people that think that saying true words or posting true words is the same thing as spreading the truth. You see, saying or posting true words is not the same thing as spreading the truth. Spreading the truth comes when I share it with gentleness and respect. And if I cannot share it with gentleness, and if I cannot post it with respect, then I am just fighting fire with fighter. Because we are told in the scriptures that our weapons are not fleshly. We are different And so if I cannot post, I cannot speak with great gentleness or respect, I'm better off to not say a word because the gospel is not just spread with true words. The gospel is spread saying true words that people will actually receive. You know, the fifth thing that we see in this passage, that the church will grow, uh, we should expect some opposition along the way. And we shouldn't be shocked by that. We shouldn't be angered by that. It's just how it works. Satan is not going to go down easily. We are involved in a real spiritual battle. This is not paintball 
This is not laser tag. This is not Fortnite. It's a real spiritual battle. There are real casualties along the way, and the enemy has a powerful arsenal. Verse 7, the proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elmias, the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul away from the faith. And so here it is. We shouldn't be shocked by opposition. We shouldn't be dismayed by opposition. It will always be there. You see, the enemy, especially these days, that Satan has a false morality, and our enemy has real power. 2 Corinthians 11:14 says, "And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light." It is not surprising then if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. You see, Satan, he doesn't care if you're moral. He's just trying to keep you from Jesus. And there are all sorts of interesting moralities these days that will keep us away from Jesus. You see, I just, I live in the light. I'm a good person. I'm kind. I stand up for justice. And then you take all the false religions. They have morality. They have good people in them. And they, Satan will love it all day long if he can make you good and keep you away from Jesus. Because if you're moral and you don't know Jesus, then guess what? He has won. And that's what the opposition will be all about. And so Satan, he has his own sense of morality, and he has power, so we should expect some opposition. And this is how Satan, he tries to stunt the growth of the church. And so we share our faith with a friend, and they seem to be really interested and open, and they're growing and they're connecting And then all of a sudden, they start dating someone, and we never see them again. Or maybe they're growing in faith, and, you know, they're here, but then, you know what? I got a great new job. I only have to work on Sundays and Wednesdays. You see, the enemy will do everything he can try to do to keep us from following Jesus. And that leads us then to the next lesson. As a church, if we're going to be growing, if we're going to be healthy, we can't go looking for fights but we shouldn't run away from fights either. You know, what we see in this passage, Saul didn't come into town looking to pick a fight with Elmaeus. You know, Saul didn't go straight towards the sorcerer. Saul confronted the sorcerer after he tried to interfere with the spread of the gospel. Verse 8, But Elmaeus the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then, then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elmaeus and said, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right way of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. You see, this is important for us because a lot of us think, you know what, I'm going to go into this town, I'm going to go on to this missions trip, and they're sorcerers, and we've got to put an end to that. And oh, there's sin over there, and there's evil over there. And what we do is we turn our vision from leading people to Jesus to changing the culture. We turn our vision from trying to reach souls to trying to get rid of sorcerers And that is not what God has called us to do. You see, Paul was not worried about shutting down a sorcerer. He was worried about saving a soul. You see, Saul, he wasn't worried about shutting down a sorcerer until after that attendant interfered with the spreading of the gospel. And so uh, the last 12 months have been kind of interesting. It's been a great season of the church But I just want you to know, uh, everyone has a reason for trying to shift the focus of the church. Um, You know, the church should have never closed its doors. The church reopened its doors far too early. You didn't say enough about George Floyd. You said too much. You're too political. You're not political enough. You need to take stronger stances on masks and vaccines. 
And so I just want to let you know something. When we as pastors, when we go to Bible school, we never take a class on epidemiology, okay? That wasn't in our core of classes. And so I'm just going to say, as a church, we're going to stay focused on souls. And if someone or something tries to get us out of the way of reaching souls, then we better be ready to fight and stand up. But I just want you to know, sinners are not the enemy. And sinners are not something that we're trying to wipe out. Actually, sinners are our target audience. That's who we're after. And if you read the story of Saul, he went from being the greatest persecutor of the church to the greatest advancer of the gospel. So we're going to stay focused on souls. And here's the last thing. But as we grow the church, we should expect there's going to be some setbacks along the way. You know, in Acts 13, this is as good as ministry gets. You know, so if we've had a good Sunday here, you know, at the end of the day, man, I just want like a huge pile of nachos. Like, (laughs) God is good, you know, let's load it up. This is a good day They talk to the most important person in the province. He wants to hear the gospel. He gives his life to the Lord. They celebrate. They probably said, let's go through the drive-thru at Chick-fil-A because they had church on Saturday. And then in verse 13, it says, From Paphros, Paul and his companions sailed to Perga in Pamphylia, where John left them to return to Jerusalem. And so... We read uh, two chapters later, John's leaving them was more significant than what we realize right here. When we read this, it just says, hey, John left them. That just seems like no big deal. Okay, he went back to Jerusalem. Um, But when they go on another missionary journey, Paul and Barnabas in chapter 15, uh, Paul feels so strongly about this, you know, that John should not go that they split ways. Paul and Barnabas, they split ways. And here's the reason. The words that Paul uses is, he says, John deserted us. He deserted us. He deserted us in our time of need, when things were just starting to go well. He leaves us in the cold. And so as the church grows, we should expect some setbacks. Jesus when he talked about how the gospel is spread and sharing the gospel seed, uh, he said the responses are going to differ. He says some is going to be like seed that is scattered on like a sidewalk. And it's not going to have a chance. Birds are going to come, take it away. It never takes root. He says other seed is going to be like in shallow soil or rocky soil. And then it takes root, but the sun will come. And because the roots are shallow, that plant will wither. He said, others, you know, that will grow very quickly, but there's all of these weeds and these thorns, and they begin to choke out the growth. But Jesus says, sometimes when we share the gospel, there's going to be such a great harvest, that plant will produce 30, 60, 100 fold what was invested. And so, In the history of this church, there's been great seasons of growth. There have been setbacks, and we shouldn't be discouraged by it. And it's all part of the process. And along with that, we should know this. We should never write someone off until their story is over. You see, when you see the setback, understand that every detour is not the end of the journey. Every failure is not necessarily final. And in the grace of God, it's often not. You see, John the deserter, he becomes the author of the Gospel of Mark. He wrote that. And yet it was after a pretty bad point in his life where he deserts guys in needs. He turns back on a missions trip. But God wasn't done with him yet. So let's make sure you and I were the type of church that doesn't give up on people as well. Until it's the last page, until that person has died, there is hope. There's redemption. The story can change. And so I just want to say, let's get ready. God's moving. We're growing. Let's go. Please stand with me this morning.
I want us to do what we do on Friday, Friday mornings, and we just kind of have a little bit of a prayer time here, and so we're just going to take a few moments here. But I want you to pray over the section that you find yourselves in. So if you're here on the floor, you can pray over your, you know, your row. Uh, pray for the row in front of you, behind you. Uh, but, you know, people are going to be kind of shifting around now with three services. And so I just want you to pray for everyone that's going to sit here next Sunday. Um, let's pray for this space that the Holy Spirit would fill it like never before. And so we're just going to have a prayer meeting here for a few moments. You're welcome to move around, though. Fill in these other rows that don't have people in them. Um, but let's just take a few moments. We're going to pray and then we'll close. Just in your own words right now, just let God know how welcome he is here. But this is his church. He is the foundation. He is the reason. Lord, we welcome you here. All of you here. Lord, we pray that when we enter this space, Lord, it would be so set apart. Let your presence would be so felt. God, that this would be a place where lives are changed, Lord, where families are restored, people are set free. And so if, if you're maybe new today, you know we've talked a lot about the church, but hopefully you've heard our heart, and our heart is for you, and our heart is for souls. And maybe you would say, you know what, my soul is hurting. My soul is not healthy. My soul is not in a good place. My soul is distant from God and Jesus has come for you. And you can just simply reach out to him right now and say, Lord Jesus, I surrender my life. I give you my life. I follow you. And I invite you to come into my life. I invite your Holy Spirit to come in and Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin. And I turn and I follow you. If you do that, your life will be changed from this morning. It will be different. You know, maybe as we talked about not writing anyone off, you'd say, you know what, my story needs a change. It needs a U-turn. And God can do that as well. And so, Lord Jesus, God, we believe that you're reaching people right now in this moment. Lord, we give ourselves fully to you. Lord, help us to see ourselves as the church. Lord, it's not just a place we go to. Lord, we are the church. We are the body of Christ. God, and every one of us is incredibly important. Lord, there's not one of us that is not essential for reaching this community. And so God, help us to all know our role, our position. Lord, help us to put our all into it. God, help us to make room in our hearts, Lord, for new people. God, help us to show hospitality. God, help us to lean on your Holy Spirit. Help us to share our faith. Help us to know the open doors, Lord, in this city. And God, we believe the best things are yet ahead. And every person who believes that says, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day today.